Um, the idea is to bring in an outside speaker uh, and to give both a technical talk, that's today's talk, and then uh, next week we'll have a, a public lecture by uh, this year's Sacker lecture, uh, Dr. Donald Linden Bell, sitting right here. Um, he's going to be in now at CETA and has been for the last couple of days. And I definitely encourage you to come talk to him. Um, Oh, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> on the closing floor, you wander right. around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. He's in your class. He's in 13. Yeah, we're in 13. Clockwise or counterclockwise? <laughs> Doesn't matter. He's actually in the lounge. So that's a good place to look as well. Uh, so, uh, Professor Lynn Bell has a, a long and uh, distinguished publication record. He's uh, um, been doing this for. Uh, so I was just discussing with him. I read one of his papers with Peter Goldreich uh, recently on uh, um, calculating the stability of, of thin disks, uh, where he actually put the tumor EQ parameter on a very rigorous footing. Uh, and in that same paper, he also suggested that feedback from stars is what tended to set Q to be one, the marginal stability value. Uh, and uh, of course, if you've been following any of my work at all, I, I rely on that all the time. There are a lot of other papers that, that he's uh, written that have been just the seminal field. The, the one that everybody always quotes is uh, Egg and Lynn and Bell and Sandage, where they argued that the Milky Way formed from a catastrophic collapse by looking at the kinematics of, of metal core stars to the galactic halo. Um, uh, but there's a number of other things he's worked on. He worked a lot on uh, accretion disks. Uh, he was the person to propose that, in fact, quasars are basically black, you know, supermassive black holes are being fed through an accretion disk. Um, which ties back to his work on appreciativeness with uh, Jim Pringle and other people. Uh, he's also got a long standing interest in general relativity, uh, a lot of work on uh, MHD and, and force free magnetic fields, uh, which he's still working on today. And uh, uh, the talk today is like the subject of today's lecture is energy and space time, because energy creates space time, and we're going to see over here. Uh, so without further ado, Eventually, all this criticism sort of went away, you know, 
got some really worked. And so, uh, but in 1885, Ernst Mach destroyed the basis of the two things that Newton felt he really had, which was absolute rotation. And Newton had this famous experiment with a bucket in which he showed that if you had the bucket with some water in it, then the concavity in the water when the whole thing was rotating was independent of whether the bucket was rotating or whether it was just the water that was rotating. That is, the water rotated. If the water rotated, it was concave. If it didn't rotate, whether the bucket rotated or not, uh, it would, it, uh, if the water didn't rotate, it would not, it would be flat. And, uh, but uh, Mark pointed out that all Newton had proved was that the flatness or concavity of the water was independent of the motion of the bucket. Not that it was absolute. <coughs> Maybe it was due to the fixed stars or the nebulae or something else. And Newton wasn't capable of removing those. And um, so the experiment didn't tell you that there was such a thing as absolute rotation. Now, Newton's other experiment, or thought experiment, was to imagine that all the markers of the world, all the star, distant stars, and galaxies, and quasars, and all the rest were removed. <coughs> and you were left with two globes and a piece of cotton. And he wanted to know whether these two globes were moving around one another or not. And he said, it's easy. You just measure the tension in the cotton. If they're going around one another, there'll be tension in the cotton. And if you want to find the non-rotating <coughs> frame, you just keep moving them with respect to you in different ways until the tension in the cotton becomes zero, and then you've got the non-rotating frame. And Mach said, nobody is capable of removing the universe. The experiment was never done, <laughs> and therefore, it tells you nothing. <coughs> Mach was quite a critic. Um, <laughs> anyway, let's go on. Um, I was an undergraduate in 1956. I'd just been to Canada the first time because my sister's a Canadian. She'd gone here in 53 or 54. And I had read Bondi's book on cosmology, and I was learning special relativity. <laughs> and I knew enough to see that if you looked at the rate of change uh, in its own <coughs> time of the momentum of a particle, it was gamma times the force and the rate of change of the force. This is going to be the four momentum, and so this is a four vector, this is the force and the rate of change of the force, and the rate of working of the force. And uh, where gamma is this thing, and there it is the three force. And on a charge passing Q, passing a fixed charge Q dash, as you probably know from the long score, that this is the force, and that you should be certain of this formula to find the rate <laughs> but as this is a four vector, you can use it, transform it by the Lorentz transformation, and you'll then find that you've got not one moving, one moving charge past another, but actually this is the original situation of a fixed charge and a moving charge and the force. But now you've got two moving charges. And as a result, this has a magnetic interaction as well as an electric interaction. But you calculate what it is because you merely Lorentz transform the four vector you had originally. So just by assuming Coulomb's law for a charge moving past another charge and special relativity, you deduce that there must be magnets. Well, I thought that was a nice argument, but it's been done many times before. So that merely says it again, except that I was interested in graph. And that's another inverse square law. So what do you deduce? You deduce that there must be 
gravimagnetism. Now, being an elementary guy, not knowing anything of what was known, and young and full of enjoyment, I, of course, thought I'd discovered a new force. Uh, and uh, that was great. So I looked all the way around the solar system to find out in those days whether it could be detected. And to my extreme annoyance, it was peanuts and was quite incapable of being detected. So I was very upset. And uh, yes, this is something I put in more recently. I, of course, didn't know enough to realize that moving masses have extra energy. And because they have extra energy, because of their motion, their attraction between one another is greater. And as a result of that, if you work out what's happening when you have just two balanced like that, with some force between them, it must actually be the same when they're both moving. You find that the gravimagnetism actually has to be sort of four times what you would have guessed from the equivalent electrical experiment. But um, I didn't know that then, so it's not necessary for the argument. Um, well, <coughs> I was very thwarted, and so I, but I read Bondi's book, and Bondi's book has a great passage on Mach and the origin of inertia and all that sort of thing. And I found that very stimulating, and so I did something quite illogical. And the illogical thing was to say, all right, Let's say I'm on Earth, I might be anywhere. But on Earth, I'm going to use Earth's axes. I'm not going to use some fictitious axes due to Newton. I can demand that I use these axes I know and think about on Earth. But then, of course, the universe is out there, and it's going round once a day. And that gives you an immense matter current sweeping round. Well, that will make a very large gravimagnetic field. Now, of course, this is quite sort of illogical. I was not taking into account the fact that the space, that mythical thing that Newton invented, was actually doing things too. So I propagated, as it were, the field as though it, the space wasn't there. I mean, as though it was just ordinary. So, but then you've got this huge current going round and round, so that produces the large magnetic field straight up. So if you move across that large magnetic field, you'll feel a sideways force. So, if you work it out in terms of some crude model of the universe, it's an undergraduate model of the universe, you must feel that. Uh, and, uh, so you get a formula that looks more or less like this, and I put in all the right things and things. And this bracket has to be one if we're going to identify the force due to this gravimagnetic, I mean, this enormous current going around us with Coriolis force. So this bracket has to be one. And this mass is the mass of the whole universe. And so, uh, you know, well, some people think that's around one. But, uh, um, anyway, uh, uh, in our axis, we see Coriolis force, and it is of that sort of form. And this gives rise to a lot of questions. And I spent, is it 50 years, you said, uh, <laughs> uh, thinking about this a bit. So is Coriolis force a real force due to the matter current in my taking axes? Is the magnitude of it telling us something about the gravitational potential of the universe of the Earth? Uh, and the conditions roughly that the universe is just those. Um, how do we do this calculation properly? Which I still really don't know how to do. Can you find <laughs> centrifugal force as well as Coriolis force? And what happens when we take accelerating axes? Now, I hope I'm going to answer sort of those questions within the context of uh, what's known in general relativity. But um, uh, let's go on. 
Uh, this leads me to cite what I'm going to call Marx's principle. There are as many statements of Marx's principle as there are people interested in it. Uh, but this is my statement. Only relative motions are real, and Newton's absolute space is a fiction. I hope I've given you some background for that. Um, anyway, it's true that Einstein thought much more deeply about this subject than Marx did. So perhaps we ought to call it Einstein's principle, but he, he has too many principles. <laughs> uh, <coughs> Einstein did two thought experiments. Now, you can see from what I told you of Newton's thought experiments that Marx was very anti-thought experiments. He believed experiments ought to be real because thought experiments could tell you nothing because they hadn't been done. But nevertheless, I think Einstein was very clever in the use of thought experiments, and I think they're very important. So I'm anti machian in that sense. Um, so uh, Einstein's two thought experiments were inside a hemisphere, or hemispherical shell, that is, well, the first experiment is just accelerating, or rotatory, you accelerate the heavy, heavy shell, and you look inside and ask, well, if I have a free particle inside, will it react to the acceleration of the heavy shell? Or will, it, will the dynamics just be the same? And if you use Newtonian mechanics, it would be exactly the same. It wouldn't feel anything due to the acceleration of a heavy shell that was right around it. But uh, uh, Einstein did that in an early edition of his general relativity not the final edition. And he found that, uh, indeed, it would slightly accelerate by a very small amount, which he couldn't measure. Um, uh, <coughs> it was a tiny amount of this the gravitational potential inside the shell divided by c squared, and this is normally a very small number for any sort of real shell. It, there would be a slight acceleration of a free particle inside that shell. And likewise, we found that if you had a rotating shell, that there would be a slight rotation of a Foucault pendulum inside the shell. The plane of the Foucault pendulum would very slightly rotate. And um, here's a youngish picture of Einstein. And uh, here is the heavy shell. And if you accelerate it up there with alpha, you'll find that a particle, a free particle inside here, which is very parallelly, very little. And likewise, if you rotate this shell, you won't find the Foucault pendulum plane, but the pendulum swing in the here. Yeah. You won't find the pendulum swing in quite the same plane as it was before, but very, very near. So this, they, uh, there is a small effect in, as I say, an early edition of General Relativity. Uh, in later editions of general relativity, the same uh, thought experiments were done by uh, Lenz and Thierry, particularly by the elder Thierry. And um, after he thought about these experiments, Einstein wrote these two facts, or these two statements. The relativity of inertia cannot be fulfilled by showing that matter merely influences inertia. It must entirely cause it. And the second one, that there is no inertia of mass against space, but only inertia of mass against mass. And nowadays, we wouldn't <coughs> use this terminology for matter and mass. We would, I think, now read mass energy. Because, uh, uh, well, because of things like gravitational waves which carry energy uh, but do not have any very obvious mass. So you can always divide the energy they have by C squared and give them that. Um, well, later on he wrote it's not easy to remove the influence of space time on inertia, and Einstein battled to find the suitable boundary conditions on his metric of infinity. Though the trouble is, is that if you set up any situation with flat space of infinity, 
you find that although you might have shells and all the rest of it inside this, that there's a very strong influence of this boundary condition at infinity on the acceleration of bodies, etc. And that most, in nearly all cases, most of the inertia is still there coming, as it were, from infinity and from your boundary condition at infinity. So Einstein looked very hard to get rid of that, and he had had this brilliant solution. It was not actually the first time that anybody had thought about closed universes. The elder Schwarzschild had asked himself, do I know the curvature of space in 1901? And he came to the conclusion that the curvature of space was certainly larger than the distance to the nearest star. <laughs> uh, but uh, he did consider the matter, and he wrote a short paper about it. Um, but Einstein's solution was to remove infinity altogether so you couldn't get that, and close the universe. And if you take a closed universe, of course, with matter in it, then you don't get this problem with there being a lot of the inertia coming from somewhere where there isn't any. This is what he said at the end of his life, or near the end of his life. <coughs> it took the great genius of Newton to invent absolute space, so essential for the development of dynamics. It's taken even greater efforts to remove the influence of absolute space from dynamics, a process that is even now still incomplete. So there's still work to do. And, uh, that's what I think is fun to try and carry out. Um, but what am I going to do? I'm going to rather quickly now give you a, an account of a Newtonian mechanics, which fulfills Markian concepts, but it's just flat space. It's just Newtonian mechanics, flat space, but there's going to be no uh, inertial axes. <coughs> Now you can derive Newtonian mechanics from Lagrange told you that uh, by minimizing uh, the Lagrangian, which is the difference between the kinetic energy and the potential energy, and the kinetic energy is just the sum of half the mv squared, uh, the sum over all the masses, and the potential energy is just uh, the sum over all pairs of masses of their gravitational interactions. Um, but if you look at this quantity, it's horrible. And the reason I say it's horrible is that this is beautiful. It just depends on the distances of things apart and not their orientation, not how they're moving, nothing to do with that. This depends as much on us as it does on it. This thing depends on what the velocities of all the particles and we've got to use some frame or another to measure those velocities. So it depends on us as well as it, whereas this just depends on it. So this is a horrible mixture. And one of the things one can do is try and relieve this of its dependence on us. So instead of using this kinetic energy, you minimize the kinetic energy over all moving frames of axes, possibly accelerating, that you can choose, and see what is the minimum kinetic energy that the system can have. And lo and behold, if you do that, you find that you're told that the frame you choose to get the minimum kinetic energy ought to be the center of mass motion, or the motion that the, the, the frame that has no momentum in it. And if you use that such a frame, you can then write a rather beautiful expression for your new kinetic energy, which just has the difference of velocities in it, and has various masses in it floating around. And it looks relative. But I say looks. <coughs> because it's a cheat. Because 
you got the, if you're interested in a difference of two velocities, to measure a velocity in the difference of two velocities, you've got to know what frame you're in rotationally. And this doesn't take that into account. Because to measure a, a, a vector velocity, you have to know that is the same direction, and a little bit later, it's still that direction. And not that direction. And that will make a difference to the velocities you measure. So, uh, in order to do, get rid of that, you have to uh, do it all again. Uh, if you just use T star, the one that we just used, we, you would find no change in the dynamics relative to the mass center or relative to anything moving uniformly with respect to, uh, well, any axes that had zero momentum for the system or, you, or constant momentum for the system. But other choices, such as accelerating things, you find forces from the rest of the universe, and you find that local systems were not independent of the rest of the universe. But there is, in the, in the um, dynamics you derive from that, there is no equation for the center of mass of the universe. There just isn't an equation for it. So you choose it. If you choose it sensibly, you can get back to Newton. If you choose it nonsensibly. Extra forces coming. However, as I said, T star is not yet called a relative. To measure velocities, that's what we found through. Now, so what we want next one to do is to minimize T star over all possible rotating axes and see whether we can get um, a, a better T star that's totally independent of us. Now, um, before doing that, it's interesting to ask how accurately do we know whether our universe is rotating or not? And there are two ways of doing that. And the standard way of doing that is to look at the frame in which the motions of the solar system, most accurately are represented by Newton's laws, plus small corrections of relativity. And if you use that, you find that well, there is such a frame in which you minimize the uh, uh, Newton's equation need no Coriolis term or need uh, uh, minimize the effects of that. And when you do that, you find that the frame that you get out of that agrees very well with the frame that you get from looking at very distant quasars and saying they remain in the same direction. And the accuracy with which that can now be done is around one rotation since the Big Bang. Not perfect, but quite close. Stephen Hawking had a very interesting paper in which he basically said, look, if you look at the <coughs> isotropy of the cosmic microwave radiation, you can tell with far greater accuracy that the basic structure of space-time the, 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 uh, in the frame of the, of the microwave background is not rotating, and you can get that to one part in 10 to the 10 in the in certain rotations since the big bang. And that's even been improved slightly with the more modern observations, but uh, essentially it's Stephen's idea. Um, well, I said we were going to minimize the kinetic energy and uh, minimize the kinetic energy. Here is the, uh, I'm already minimized over the velocities, uh, uh, <coughs> kinetic energy over uniform velocities. Uh, but now we're going to minimize this over all possible rotating axes. And if we do that, you find, um, an interesting answer that if you use the axes in which there's no r cross v or m r cross v for the universe as a whole, when you sum all those things. So if you, if you use the frame in which the universe as a whole does not rotate, 
then you get exactly back to Newton's laws. Provided, of course, that that is what Newton calls the nominative. So in a universe that does not rotate, you can write down a totally relative mechanics <coughs> that agrees perfectly with Newton. But if the universe as a whole was rotating, it wouldn't agree perfectly with Newton. Um, so there's that difference with Newton, but that really does mean that since our universe, we've got rather good evidence that our universe does not rotate, it, uh, in the Newtonian sense, uh, that then that is really telling one that, the, um, uh, that a, a totally relative mechanics would work very well. And so you can get a totally relative mechanics, <coughs> which uh, is independent of absolute space, and uses, as it were, the universe as its state of their emotion. Um, but now, I'm not going to go into general relativity and talk about uh, a problem that looks impossible, and it's actually rather simple. And this problem is, you want to discover, <coughs> we want to do Einstein's thought experiment. You remember he had a rope attached to a hollow sphere. And he accelerated the hollow sphere and showed you that there was a very weak effect inside the hollow sphere. But instead of doing it all with very weak fields and very small accelerations, I want to have a heavy hollow sphere or at least a hollow sphere that's got a good big potential compared with C squared inside it. And I want to give it a rapid acceleration, not a weak acceleration. And those of you who are relatives would, relativists would probably say that looks quite impossible. Because, you know, the gravitational waves are going to be setting out all over the place from this thing, and uh, it, it looks a devilish problem. However, it's actually very easy because of a beautiful thing <coughs> was noted particularly by Singh, but I think originally comes from somebody else, but it's in Singh's book, is what are called conformal station, conformal static metrics. These are metrics in which it's the equivalent of a very simple Newtonian idea. And the Newtonian idea is this. Suppose you have a set of charges all of the same sign, <coughs> and you give a very small charge, and you give each charge a mass, and you make sure that the gravitational attraction between any two of these charged masses is exactly balanced by the electrical repulsion. Of course, it's terribly unstable. If you kicked anything, it would fall off things. But anyway. Those things, now the equivalent of that in general relativity is one of the few very general solutions in general relativity that can be solved. So you can solve for a static set of charges and masses. All, of, all, the, all the masses have a certain very small charge, <coughs> such that it's exactly balanced. Now what you do is you take a very large one of these with a large mass m and appropriate proportional charge Q, and you make a sphere of the same stuff, a hollow sphere of the same stuff up here, with a mass little m, mass of <coughs> charge little Q, and you make this much smaller than I've drawn it, because I wanted to see, you to see that dot inside. And then you, that is all just a static situation, and of course, this sphere is held up against the gravity of this mass by this electric field, which is caused by this charge Q. And all the relative things of this sphere, they all balance out, because everything balances. But I'm not going to cheat very, very slightly. You are going to be an observer. And Peter is uncharged, and he's small. 
And he's going to be here, the observer O, falling under the influence of this heavy mass because he doesn't feel all these charges. So he's accelerating rapidly. And then there's a speck of dust, which is also <coughs> uncharged, which is this speck of dust inside here. Now, what does Peter see? He sees a, a spherical shell, which can be quite massive. It certainly can be, it has to be quite, it's quite small, uh, and it, but it can be small enough that it has a large potential, although it's quite trapped. And so inside it, there can be a large potential inside there. And he sees that this is being rapidly accelerated upwards relative to him by this large electric field. And you can then look and see what happens to this uncharged speck of dust. And the question is, does it fall as fast as Peter? Or is it given an extra acceleration upwards? And this way you can use statics to solve what looked like a difficult dynamical problem. And indeed, you can get an answer out of all that. Slightly more complicated than what I've said, but very little. We had to correct our result this year, maybe 10 years ago. Um, but uh, it's an interesting result. And it gives you a nice result. Now, let's look also at this, which was done by Lindlow and Brill quite a long time ago. They took a very heavy charge, they take from an uncharged, a very heavy, massive, um, uh, shell of dust that was falling inwards under its own gravity and rotating. And if you're inside this, what they found and what everybody else has found since, of course, is that if you're inside this, you feel nothing. But if somebody from the outside world watches you, they would say that you gradually rotate it in sympathy with this thing. Not at the same rate, but a much smaller rate. However, a remarkable thing happens. It really is rotating flat space inside there. And as this shell starts rotating faster and faster as it goes in, you don't see it. You have to calculate it, because if you're going to see it, it means light to come out. But this flat space, as calculated from infinity, rotates uniformly without time delay for the signal to get from there into here. It's just a flat space, and it remains a flat space. So there's no delay in getting in. It's just a, this flat space and is flat, and it rotates relative to the flat space of infinity. But it's the connection that is being changed. If you look at the stars from inside here, of course, the starlight would have to come through the shell. But if you make it come through the shell, you would see the stars apparently going backwards. And they would suffer a time delay because they go through at different times. Um, so that was what you can calculate quite well. But you can only calculate this nicely to first order in this angular velocity omega. And you find, as I said, that, that there's actually no Coriolis force if you stick to your axes inside. You don't see anything. If you use information from the outside world and try and keep up with the stars that you see is rotating backwards, then of course you'll get a Coriolis force because you're using the wrong axes. But you, you will get uh, this. Um, uh, uh, if you make sure that your axes are the same as infinity, you get Coriolis force induced by the rotation of the sphere. And if you use the axes that are non-rotating as infinity. Um, I think I think that's the same thing. This is more fun. Um, I, I sort of do that again. Um, what we're going to do now is, instead of having a sphere here, and rotating a sphere, a sphere has 
the stress energy momentum tensor. It's got real matter in it, you know, and you can feel. But a gravitational wave is more ethereal. It has energy, it can have angular momentum, but it hasn't got a stress energy momentum tensor. It's the space is actually empty space. And what we did was to make the experiment of making a rotating gravitational wave and seeing what its effect was. This rotating sphere induces a, uh, a rotation relative to infinity of the inertial frame inside the sphere. Can you do it without any stress energy momentum tensor, as it were, just by gravitational wave? And the answer is yes. And here is a picture of the gravitational wave going in, and you watch it, and you'll see it's a trailing wave as it comes out. And if I do it again, that it's a leading wave as it goes in. That is, the outside is going round as it goes in. And it uh, it's faster than the inside, and then the inside is going around faster than the outside as it goes around as it comes out. And it's very flat in the whole of this region here for all time. And I'll show you another picture in a different form of the same thing. Um, that central piece remains remarkably flat. And that is just telling you that in practice, the, um, all the buckling of space time due to the wave is always confined outside the region you're interested in. But if you look at that inertial frame in the middle level, you'll find that that is rotating, and it has exactly the same behavior as the bucket behavior. Um, Centrally, of course, you can't do properly with spheres. And the reason for that is that central force is a, causes a force away from the axis. And it's not got the same symmetry as the sphere. <coughs> and so you have to hold the sphere together with forces. And those forces haven't got the symmetry of the sphere that makes it very awkward. However, you can do it with cylinders. And this was done by Embacher some years ago. And he took a rotating cylinder, an infinite rotating cylinder, <coughs> and solved it to all orders in omega. So you can actually look for induced centrifugal force, by which I mean you, as it were, take axes of infinity that are okay, then you rotate the cylinder very fast, and in the axes that were okay with infinity, you'll find that the frame inside rotates and therefore has centrifugal force. But you can just sit in the middle in a hammock or on a chair and you feel absolutely nothing. Because it's, it's just a rotation of the frame. The frame is perfectly good. It's flat space in there. Now, all these are well-established results in the um, As people go to sleep at this stage in the lecture, I uh, I have a special question for everybody, and this is what you have to think about. Here's a chap with a very thin piece of cotton, and it's attached to a very small mass, which goes through a hole in a very heavy sphere, which has a large potential, uniform potential inside here, and you need to worry about it. It's a uniform potential inside here. And uh, he pulls it. And this is a question I'm going to ask you all to think about. And I give you three answers, none of which, let me say, are remotely complete. But they're indicative of the sort of argument that you might think about. This mass is like a mass down a deep well. It's, it's lost a lot of energy by going re 
down into this potential well inside. Mass down the hole has lost energy, and so it must have lost mass too. So it must be easier for this chap to pull. Because he's trying to accelerate something that's not worth as much. Second argument, space inside the sphere is flat. Space at infinity is flat. Doesn't make any difference. He just has to do forces of mass and acceleration, just some same as he ever did. So that's fine. And the third argument is the sort of argument that Mach might have used, that he thought of inertia as due in some sense to other masses. This one, when the heavy thing is round there, it should be influenced by the fact that there's more heavy mass near it. And so inertia is due to other masses as a result of the other masses being nearer and more present. It's actually harder than it would have been without the heavy sphere. And the question is which of those arguments is nearer to the truth? Well, I can't tell you. We'll have a vote at the end. <laughs> um, yeah, we're running out of time, but we're just about okay. Uh, how are we doing this time? Are you getting near the end? That's fine. Yeah, uh, this uh, does things nicely. <coughs> a flux integral. Now, if there's a charge inside somewhere and you have any old surface around it, you know that there's a certain flux of electrical fields through it, and you can work out how much charge there is inside just by <coughs> adding up the flux all the way around the outside. Now, there are things like that in our relativity for angular momentum. So you can tell how much angular momentum there is inside a surface by adding up a certain integral of things around the outside of the surface. Now that much tells you a very interesting thing about all closed universes. So I, it, because it's harder to think in closed universes in three dimensions, think as though the world was just on the surface of a sphere. And then you're on a little flat patch of it, or nearly flat patch of it. And you draw a circle round, and you find out how much angular momentum there is inside that little flat patch. And then you can increase the size of this patch. And each time, you get a certain flux. But when you go, like if the sphere was round me, if it went all the way around, the size of that surface would eventually shrink to zero back around the back. So the angular momentum of any closed universe is zero, because there's no surface area over which the flux gives you. This is a true fact, and it's true to take any old uh, closed surface that's uh, anything that's got the topology of the sphere. So that's very nice, actually. It's very marked in so He said that, said that, closed, uh, that, that the inertial frame agreed with the angular momentum of the universe, provided that the angular momentum of the universe was zero. Uh, then, then, then we were okay with the Newtonian mechanics. And lo and behold, down relativity with closed universes does it for us exactly. Uh, that's beautiful. Now, uh, let's start this discussion of cosmology without any cosmic constant. I'll get back to the cosmic constant. Let's start without any. And then we have these universes. And if we demand that the universe be closed, then what do they do? They come out of the Big Bang, bigger and bigger and slower and slower, and then they come back to the Big Crunch. I'm 
that I'm not there. But, um, maybe some of my atoms will do. Uh, anyway, probably you won't. Uh, consider closed universes without any dark energy. They expand until they reach, well, I don't know, it's the old Schwarzschild or, Mil or Mitchell radius that they reach uh, for the uh, uh, M is uh, the sort of total mass N they contain, and R is the radius, and this is the uh, maximum radius they get to. It. And uh, it's actually the energy of half the universe because <laughs> it becomes difficult to define the energy of the whole thing. Anyway, as R is proportional to M, we find that this density at maximum radius is actually inversely proportional to the mass. That's actually very interesting. means that the sort of densities that things go down to in the expansion and recontraction, if you have a really massive universe, they go down to much lower densities than if you have a universe with lots of matter, with very little matter. It'll go down to only rather high density. If you want to approach Minkowski space, or Plaid space, you need a very large M. Now, let's just consider in a moment what's going to happen if we try and get rid of all the mass in the universe. Imagine comparing lots of different universes different total masses, different total mass energies. So some of them will be small and they go and some of them will be large and they go Now if you compare them and you try and remove more and more mass for it, the time between the Big Bang and the Big Crunch becomes smaller and smaller as the mass becomes smaller. And the densities become larger and larger all the time, because they're never, on average, less than the one that had maximum radius. And when you remove all the mass of the universe, the space disappears, the time And in that, she makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, that, I think, is instructive and very marked. But now you would say, ah, but there's a cosmological constant. There's an acceleration of the universe. <coughs> and there is. You can still get closed universes with a cosmological constant. And you can get closed accelerating. But if you try this sort of experiment that I've just given you a thought experiment about with lambda, the cosmical uh, acceleration of the constant, fixed, then when you remove all the matter in the universe, you'll get down to the, sit the sitter space. And that has all the inertia and everything just like flat space does. It's not quite the same. But essentially, it's very non marked So no mass, but the particles have all the inertia that. Uh, however, if you think of lambda as a contribution to mc squared, that is, if you think of dark energy as a real energy and therefore a contri contributor to the mass, then as you remove the mass, you will eventually recover the sort of behavior that we had before. And then you will see that uh, you will get back to a very Markian situation. So my view is that lambda is probably not a fundamental constant of nature, but is actually something that is related to, in some sense, the total mass of our universe, or the mass energy of the universe. Uh, just as a speculation to make you think, 
I put in the last segment here, were this true of lambda, might it not be true of g? I'll stop there. Unless you want to have a vote on which of these things is right. That's how long. You want to vote. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you're better than most glasses. <laughs> 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 